go. Uh, I wanted to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we have a, a huge variety of folks from the GA community, and we appreciate you all being here. But I also wanted to just give a <coughs> shout out to Kendall and Doc for taking their own time, uh, quite a bit of time actually, to prep for this, uh, to get materials ready, to think through how they are going to present it to you, uh, all on their own time and sharing with you uh, some serious passion that they both have for Dickens, but also for teaching. Um, so, you know, a round of applause virtually for both of you. Uh, thank you again for taking your time. I know that Our it's pleasure. rewarding for both of you just to, just to present to this group, so. A lot of fun. We appreciate being the beneficiaries. Um, also, just let me sh share my screen just briefly because I, if I can find this, oh, maybe I can't. <clears throat> Sorry, I know I'm taking time here. I just wanted to share with you what the um, Patriot Connect looks like for those of you that aren't on there and why it's beneficial to be on there. Um, I did want to clarify with you all that you obviously can join this call without being in on Patriot Connect or in the group. The benefit of it is just that you can have access to those materials um, in one place. You don't have to search through your email. Uh, I'll be posting all of Kendall's pre-readings and also the links to the videos afterwards. And then access to each other and to Kendall and Doc, you know, as questions come up, as you have thoughts about the discussion or about the reading or that kind of thing. It's just a good place to interact. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, my screen share is not uh, working right. So, uh, but perhaps I'll send you a couple of screenshots just so you can see what it's like. Uh, and if you have any trouble and need some help getting in there, um, I'm always available to help with that. Are, are we ready to go, Heather? Yes. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to uh, our newest class. Dickens England, the early years. Um, this will actually be a two part course. Um, next year we'll, we'll do part two, but this takes the kind of the first half of, of Dickens' career um, and is built around uh, Oliver Twist. We hope that uh, some of you have chosen to read the novel um, and uh, we'll follow along and get in, in, involved in our, our discussions. But um, I want to take some time. I'm the history guy here, and uh, and I'll always have some context for our our topical conversation, our topics that we will talk about each week, and uh, you'll know in advance what those topics will be. You were told um, we we're going to talk about the uh, the workhouse and the poor laws this time, and um, you'll always get a, a reading with with that goes along with our topics and. Um, a poem that Doc will also use to discuss each week. And um, so I'll have some history, but a little bit more today, just because uh, to give you an overview of the world that, that Dickens was uh, growing up and living in. So here we go. Um, start off with a, with a, a vocab word here, Dickensian. Um, I hang out with a bunch of Dickensians, mostly based out of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and it, the term Dickensian can, can mean a, a number of things, but for our purposes, um, here are some shared traits that we, we might be able to utilize in our discussions for the next six weeks. Um, so it's often an equivalent to Victorian, the Victorian period, which is of course what we're studying here. Um, it also relates to attentiveness to social conditions, something that was near and dear to Dickens. Um, includes a cast of hyperbolic, romanticized, or sordid characters. Uh, probably the thing he's, he, Dickens, is best known for is his characterizations. Uh, it's sentimental. Um, for some people, um, it's right. For some, it's too much sentiment. That's something that Doc will be pursuing. Um, and the author's work had broadened the collective cultural imagination to the point where a new way of seeing or describing the world needed to be monumentalized in language. So if you are a Dickensian, it can mean several different things. A New England emerges. Um, following the Napoleonic Wars, 
and England was changing. Um, Dickens is born in 1812, so he's born actually before uh, Waterloo. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is well underway. A lot of people think, um, don't realize that it started a lot earlier, uh, long before the American Revolution, frankly, and was transforming uh, British society. Events from 1815 to 1830 would lay the foundation for modernity and progress. Um, and Queen Victoria was coronated at age 18 on the 28th of June, 1838. So those, those are kind of some broad parameters. Um, the impact of the Napoleonic Wars is, is pretty significant. Um, first of all, England having overcome its <laughs> losses at the hands of our American patriots, um, it will reemerge following the defeat of Napoleon as kind of the top dog um, in Europe and um, regain some of its stature and prestige. Um, but at the same time, coming home, um, it, it, the veterans for the most part are, are not gonna be doing well. They aren't coming home to jobs, they're impoverished. And um, over time, this is gonna be a problem. With... As mentioned before, British society is in transition. Um, there's both an agrarian and an industrial revolution taking place. And for our purposes, one of the biggest impacts on, on of those two pieces is the fact that you're going to have more and more people leaving the rural areas of England and moving to the cities. And um, that migration will have a dramatic impact on this time period and something that uh, Dickens was concerned with. So the political system of England at this time, it's a constitutional monarchy and it had been evolving as a constitutional monarchy ever since 1688-89 um, at the hands of the Glorious Revolution, which my students, and there's a few sitting out there in the audience, uh, I'm sure remember uh, quite well. Uh, this would establish a limited monarchy. So all of a sudden, England is going to begrudgingly step away from an absolute monarchy and instead um, have to share power with um, a, a bunch of people who are still royalists and absolutists at first, although over time, um, this is gonna change and it's gonna change a lot during Dickens time period. So you have a two house parliament and um, it, the, the list here, the religious dissenters, the industrialists, the reformers, the aristocracy, the country gentlemen, the merchants, um, they're, they're not, placed properly. I didn't stick them in the House of Lords because that's where they are, but these are some of the, the major interest groups that will uh, help to develop the constitutional monarchy. There is no written constitution. They, they still don't have a written constitution, but um, it's, it's an idea that they will respect and um, proceed with. And so an accumulation of laws will be kind of the foundational piece of the constitution. But there is no definition for you know, defining the powers of say the House of Lords versus the House of Commons. It, it evolves uh, over time and they accept those practices. Uh, during his lifetime, there, there's four monarchs, George III, George IV, William IV, and of course, Queen Victoria, uh, the longest reigning monarch in English history until, of course, Elizabeth II, who is setting all kinds of records these days. I never knew I'd be talking about a platinum monarchy. Um, I put this in mostly because I like the painting. Um, Turner was, was, was a great painter. Um, the House of Parliament is going to burn, and um, it's, it, it's, it's quite a notable event. And um, it's a, somewhat of a, sit, a setback, but it's also kind of a metaphor for the time. Um, and they'll spend a great deal of time and money rebuilding Westminster, and it too becomes a symbol. Um, Cost is two million pounds, which is exorbitant for the time. Uh, construction will last 30 years, but most of it's done by 1852, as you can see at the bottom bullets. 
the Lords are sitting in their new chambers in 47, Commons in 52. And I think the other thing to note here is that um, it's uh, obviously, if you've seen it or seen photographs, it's, it's a rather large structure. And they actually added land into the Thames River, um, did a lot of dredging and filling in. Um, so where the, the one edge, and I don't know my compass points for the parliamentary building, but um, part of it sits on the former Thames River. Um, there's a couple, and, and this was in one of Doc's questions for tonight. Um, th there's a couple, of two fundamental points that serve as important background. Um, we can throw around terms like Whigs and Tories, which doesn't mean a whole lot, or we can use the terms uh, liberal and conservative, but they in no means mean anything like what we think of today necessarily. Uh, particularly liberalism, 19th century lib liberalism is based on Locke's ideas, um, quote, being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions, what we call natural rights. And of course, that should sound familiar if you're um, the, the Declaration of Independence uh, because of life, liberty, and, and the pursuit of happiness, which was property. And he also said people have the right to revolt. Um, he is a liberal, and a liberal in 19th century terms meant that you were opposed to absolutism and that people should have individual liberty and freedom to do within the frame of law what they want to do. And they, liberals, um, saw the monarchy, the royalists, the aristocracy as impinging upon those things. Edmund Burke, who actually precedes Locke by a few years, defended um, abs uh, defended the monarchy, not necessarily absolutism, but he believed in traditions and he was afraid that um, traditions which were, are the underpinning of wisdom and virtue would uh, be set aside by liberals. Uh, and when he's thinking or talking about tradition, he's talking really about the church and the aristocracy, um, and the monarchy. So this, this is the, the big clash uh, of the two big points of view, uh, which in some ways, of course, is still with us today. Uh, my former students know that, you know, I talk about history is the uh, competition between uh, liberty and order. And I think all history is defined by that. Um, you have those who want all liberty and those who all want order. And the um, best place to be, in my opinion, of course, is right there in the middle with a balance between liberty and order. And that's what Locke and, and Burke were doing. Okay, enough of that. I don't go into the woods, the, the weeds here. Um, Waterloo, um, sorry, Napoleon talked about, described England as a, na a nation of shopkeepers, and he was using it in a, in a derisive sense. But by 1815, um, it really was a nation of shopkeepers. Uh, mercantilism was alive and well. And mercantilism was propped up by the monarchy. Uh, that's how the American colonies got established uh, with a favorable balance of trade. We're selling raw products to England and they're selling finished products back to us. And, and, and that's what England was doing with all its colonies. And that created a merchant class, which of course is the middle class. And that's gonna be a game changer. But um, grounded in all this is a class system. You know, the, the English were founded on a class system, uh, which goes back to um, pre-medieval times. And so kind of a ranking here, British style is monarchy, Anglican church, the landed aristocracy, uh, then the middle class. Um, once we get into the heavy industrial revolution, there's gonna be a group between the two bullets of aristocracy and middle class with the very wealthy upper middle class, the agrarian working class, urbanization, and the industrial working class, which is um, starting small, but it too will be pushing up uh, the chain there as, as we pass through the years of, of Charles Dickens. Um, Laissez-faire, French term, hands off. Um, that's 
essentially the uh, liberal concepts of, of John Locke, keep government out of business, get out of our way, let us make money and everybody else will make money if we're making money. Um, and I'm not gonna get into um, a lot of these philosophies. Uh, it's, it's other better things we should probably be talking about. Um, Malthus will, will pop up here in our discussion and Bentham, who I didn't put here, um, when we're talking about Dickens uh, ideas that he will attack when we talk about the Christmas Carol in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll get into heavy Malthus and, and Benthian, uh, Benthamite discussions. So 1815, the end of, of the Napoleonic Wars, the veterans are coming home. Um, the middle class is growing as a result of the industrial revolution along with the working class. Um, and the middle class are becoming restive. They, they know that the middle class in France, depending on what time you're talking about, after 1789, the French Revolution, um, was enjoying uh, liberties that it didn't have. Uh, the English middle class uh, was reading about Locke and, and believed in natural rights. And so they essentially, keep it simple, want the right to vote. They want to uh, have a say in government. And um, England, the, the, the government of England is petrified that the French flu, as I'm calling it, uh, will cross the English Channel and infect the English um, with ideas that they deem to be extreme. Um, and the first big event is what was nicknamed the Peter Blue Massacre. It was in the St. Peter Field, St. Peter's Field um, area. And so mimicking Waterloo, this was known as the Peterloo Massacre. Um, it was pretty significant, um, an, an amassing of 60,000 people. And, and by um, Manchester, that's, which is, in, is north of, of London, um, is, is a pretty significant number. Uh, population of Manchester isn't huge yet in 1819. Um, and it's, the crowd is dispersed, as you can see in this cartoon, by the English cavalry, and 15 people will die. Um, I had a photograph, but what happened to it? My photograph disappeared. I had a, sorry, I had a photograph of, of the event. Um, it somehow disappeared on me, or else it'll pop up in a little while. Um, so in reaction to the Peterloo massacre, the government takes action. You know, this is a reactionary uh, mode, which is what monarchs on the continent have been doing when talk of revolution occurs. And essentially it was to silence the troublemakers. Um, it prohibited meetings over 50 people. Uh, government magistrates had the power to search private houses. Uh, and you didn't need warrants in those days. Um, it prohibited drilling and military training. Some of this should sound familiar because the same kinds of actions were taken against the uh, American colonials in the lead up to the American Revolution. Strengthened laws against blasphemous and seditious libel, which means it can't criticize the monarchy or the aristocracy. Severely restricted the time for an accused to prepare his defense if he was arrested and increase the amount of stamp tax placed on newspapers and cheap pamphlets. I put this in on purpose. I'm sure you all remember the stamp tax, the Stamp Act, and how what role that played in the American Revolution. And of course, we get rid of it. Um, there still is a stamp tax that the British citizens are paying and have been paying for a very long time. Um, and this was to make uh, it more expensive to buy a pamphlet that might be radical, that might promote uh, trouble. And lo and behold, there are going to be revolutions. Um, the big revolutions following the French are in 1830 and 1848. I could spend two class sessions just talking about those revolutions. I'm not. Um, but again, uh, these are things that the English are, are going to take note of, and they're going to be grateful that they have an English channel separating themselves 
from the continent. And of course, if you ask an Englishman if they're a European today, uh, they'll scoff at you. Um, they're English, they're, they're not European. Um, these are two cartoons um, addressing the whole fears that they have about the, the French Revolution. All right, I'm losing my... There you go. Um, so they take action. Uh, remember 1819, the Peterloo massacre, then there's the revolutions on the continent of 1830. Lo and behold, in 1832, parliament will act and it'll pass the first of three reform acts um, spread over time. Uh, the reform acts will give the right to vote to many, not all, um, English citizens. Uh, women are still gonna be struggling um, for the right to vote into the 20th century. So what does the first Reform Act do in 1832? And in 1832, uh, Charles Dickens is now 20 years old. He was born in 1812. It extended the vote to small landowners, tenant farmers, shopkeepers, and householders, those who owned a home, and paid at least 10 pounds tax a year. It abolished rotten boroughs. Um, shorthand, uh, this was a, a voting district that had maybe... 20 people living in it and gave the Lord who lived there uh, a, a huge amount of power that was totally unfair, certainly not representative. Um, we can't use the word democratic here because it's, it's certainly a foreign term to all Englishmen at that time, including even most radicals. And radical here is with a capital R, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, extended representation to the cities. Imagine before 1832, all the industry, which is up north of London for the most part, much of it, in places like Manchester and Liverpool, uh, where you know hundreds of thousands of people live, there's no representation in Parliament. Uh, that is a really bad situation, and that will be addressed um, in the in the Reform Act of 32, uh, and it explicitly bars women from voting. I mean, it's put into there. It's not like it's just assumed. But they say women can't vote. That's a paraphrase. Um, but this is a big deal. This is a game changer, just like the uh, Glorious Revolution of 1888-89 was. Um, troubles, though, um, along with the changing social conditions of industrialization and urbanization and people leaving the farms, um, uh, uh, there's a series of bad crops in the 1830s, uh, late 1830s and into the 40s. And so in English history, this becomes known as the hungry 40s. And the hungry 40s are, are, are going to be important uh, and a, a major influence on Charles Dickens and his thinking and in his writing, as we shall see. Um, so the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws is a classic example of the power of the aristocracy. It was established right at the end of, of um, the Napoleonic Wars. And the aristocracy, who are essentially wealthy farmers, they have all this land and then they, they rent it out and they live off the rents for, to, to some degree. Um, and they were having to compete with cheaper corn and other grains from the continent. And so the corn laws put an artificial and very high tariff, that's a tax on imported goods on corn, um, so that poor people who essentially live off of bread in those days um, would have to spend a lot more money just to eat to survive. And those corn laws are gonna stay on the books from 1815 to 1846 when they're finally repealed. And that will add to the hungries um, because of the inflated price unfairly of, of grains. Um, there's a, 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 essentially a depression from a, a, a trade slump in 1839, which causes unemployment. There's the poor harvests, throw in the potato blights that occurred in Northern England, plus of course, most famously in Ireland. Um, and a major depression sets in in the 1840s, so known as the Hungry 40s. 
as I mentioned, the uh, famine in Ireland. And of course, this is where the United States now is going to be forced to deal with an, a new large incoming immigrant uh, population, uh, essentially Catholic um, and Irish, which were <laughs> these, uh, the Irish were, were frowned upon by, by many Americans at that time and uh, kind of our first major immigrant problem, but that's something I talked about in another class. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and the English were happy to see the, the Irish leave. After Peterloo, and there's a new organization that's, that is going to evolve over time, secretly at first, but coming out in public in 1838. And they are nicknamed the Chartists. Um, and their movement becomes known as Chartism. And it's because they write a charter, which they, now that they have some representation, since 1832 in parliament, they decide they will present to parliament to say, we need more reform. Uh, and it, it's a pretty uh, advanced set of thoughts um, that will in time, of course, be incorporated. But right now, even by the middle class, um, there's not gonna be a lot of receptivity for their demands. Vote for every man aged 21 years and above uh, who's of sound mind and hasn't, you know, been a criminal, a secret ballot to protect the exercise of voting, but no property qualification for members of parliament. That meant members of the working class of the middle class um, who needed to work um, could still serve in parliament. In those days, if you worked, there's, even if you were middle class work, you couldn't afford to be in parliament. So it favored the wealthy. Uh, Payment of MPs, now because now that's the other piece, they're gonna pay salaries to the members of parliament. Um, equal representation in districts, um, they have their own game of gerrymandering just like we have today. Um, and it's a problem that fortunately for the English, they will essentially get rid of. Um, we have never gotten rid of ours. And uh, annual parliamentary elections. So they're gonna hold annual elections, which had not yet been made um, before 1838. So those demands will be placed before parliament. They'll reject them. And the charters are gonna hang around um, till about 1857. Um, and this cartoon kind of addresses the class issue um, at that time. Special constable, now mind, you know, if I, if you, if I kill you, it's nothing. But if you kill me by Jingo, it's murder. Ah, <laughs> this is the photograph of Peter Lou. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the Chartist. Pardon me. Uh, this is a Chartist meeting. And um, one of our early photographs, uh, photography was coming in now. Um, Sarah, who's in attendance with us, um, might want to talk about photography sometime. And um, this was the gathering. This was an impressive group uh, of people and it scared the bejesus out of parliament and the middle class. Okay, that's the background to uh, what's going on in England as Dickens is being born and uh, turning into a young adult. So let's turn to Charles Dickens at this point. Um, Charles John Huffam Dickens born 7th February, 1812. His father, his mother, and that's his birthplace. His father um, was a naval clerk in the accounting offices and um, he's a problem. Um, he's a spendthrift. He never lives according to his means. He will end up at Marshall Sea Prison in debt. And at that point, Dickens is 12 years old. Um, Dickens, John Dickens owed 40 pounds to a baker. 40 pounds is a lot of money in those days, uh, particularly just for the baker. And um, so John Dickens is gonna be placed in prison for six months um, till he gets somebody to pay his debt. Uh, Charles Dickens is 12 years old. He's in school. He will be forced to leave school and he will work, he will live on his own and he will work at Warren's Blacking Factory. 
if you've read David Copperfield, then you know essentially what that's all about. He's going to paint labels onto ink bottles. Um, six days a week, he had Sundays off. He would walk 12 miles, he's a 12 year old, uh, to see his family in prison, visit, visit them for the day and then have to walk back. Um, this is a major piece of Dickensian history uh, that will have a profound impact on Charles all of his life. Uh, and it crops up time and time again in his writing and certainly Oliver Twist is included. Um, quote from Dickens, I really believed at the time that they had broken my heart. Uh, that's David Copperfield in the upper right hand corner from the novel, um, sitting there painting labels, obviously very depressed. Uh, you could replace the name David Copperfield, Charles Dickens, uh, very autobiographical piece. And one of the actual bottles that, uh, well, not actual bottles that Dickens labeled, but uh, uh, from that company, from that time period. And Warren's is the building on the right hand side in this uh, 1824 print. Um, obviously Dickens overcomes that stressful moment in his, in his young life. Um, that's 1824, in 1825, he's back in school uh, for a short time, Bollington House Academy, and two years later, he goes to work. So that means age 15. Um, and he takes the moment when his family is evicted from their latest house, and he becomes a law clerk. He will teach himself shorthand, and he will begin to freelance. And that will land him a job as a, a parliamentary reporter from 1831 to 34. And it's during this 31 to 34 that he's contemplating writing as a career. Um, here he is, allegedly, you know, this is an artistic rendering of him submitting his first piece to the monthly magazine in 1833. Um, who knows if there's any accuracy to that, but anyway, that's what it's supposed to be. Um, in 1834, he's going to join the Monthly Chronicle as a reporter and get paid per piece that he writes. In 1836, he's going to marry Catherine Hogarth, who we'll be talking about when we discuss women in, um, in one of our sessions. And he begins to publish sketch Sketches by Boz. Uh, from 33 to 35, um, Dickens is writing these pieces for various um, publications, including the Monthly Chronicle and the Monthly Magazine, but others as well, including newspapers. And these pieces are going to be collected um, and they'll become known as Sketches by Boz. And at this, it's at this time in 36 that he will begin embark upon the Pickwick Papers, which is what's going to skyrocket him and essentially into superstardom. Um, in 1837, his first of 10 children will be born and the serialization of Oliver Twist begins. So, you know, it's 1825 to 1837 is where he really kind of comes together um, with the start of his career as a novelist. He almost became an actor. He uh, was gonna try out at the Covent Gardens and he was ill that day, or at least that's what people, some people think. And he didn't show up uh, for his tryout. And so his acting career, which will be remain amateur, um, he will write a couple plays. He even writes an opera, uh, the, the libretto, not the music. And uh, he will perform from time to time, particularly in his younger years, uh, but only as an amateur and uh, not for pay. But his acting, um, let me go back, his acting is going to be fundamental in his writing style. And, and Doc will be talking about this. Um, we'll be talking about this later. Uh, okay, he's going to become a reformer. I got to start moving fast here. And um, there's various reforms in England that are, that are discussed. And again, it's always in the background, the fear of the French Revolution, 
Um, this is a political cartoon from post French Revolution, but showing the English uh, fearful of, uh, of the nastiness of, of the French. So the electoral system, the child labor, reform of the poor laws, free trade, education reform, prison reform, public sanitation, women's suffrage. Um, Dickens will dip into a number of these. Women's suffrage is certainly not going to be one of them, though. Um, so the poor law, very quickly. Poor law has been around since the 1600s. Um, the poor or, or paupers were taken care of by the, each parish church. Um, kind of like a county, and um, it was up to the church to take care of them. But those po that population grows um, significantly, and, and the churches can no longer take care of the needs of all the paupers that are living in their parishes. So a, a new poor law is, is going to be enacted, uh, and that's the one that Dickens is going to take on. Um, this cartoon here on the right, if you've seen... Um, the uh, Disney version of Oliver Twist, then that should look, well, actually those people are in every one of the movies too. Um, a bunch of fat guys sitting around stuffing their faces with uh, turkey and, and lots of good food. And meanwhile, outside the kids are starving, eating gruel. Uh, and they're the ones who are deciding um, the fate of all the paupers. Um, a penny press, we'll be talking about the penny press. Uh, this is a cheap uh, pamphlet attacking the poor law. This would be a reflection of the, of the working class opinion. So the poor law amendment. Um, the whole thing was designed to discourage poverty. That's how they thought they could solve this. So if they could convince people that who were poor that uh, they didn't, they shouldn't be poor, but somehow they would figure out how not to be poor because they certainly didn't want to go into the workhouses. And that was the concept of the basic middle-class person who is a liberal at this time. You should work hard, take care of yourself. You shouldn't expect the government to take care of you. That should sound kind of familiar. Um, resources could no longer keep up with the needs according to Malthus, who again, we'll talk about later. And Bentham, if relief is seen as pleasant, they'll refuse to work. Um, there's a parallel there with uh, all the assistance some people were receiving during the pandemic, but we won't go there. Um, the law was passed enthusiastically. Uh, impact was dramatic and immediate um, and nasty. And it's this that Dickens, of course, is going to attack in, in Oliver Twist, Twist and some very memorable things. Uh, those are photographs, uh, legit photographs of workhouses of adult men and adult women separated. And of course, children are in a whole different building themselves. Uh, all they had was gruel, literally. And there's even a recipe for gruel in the Amendment Act of 1834. Um, Newly discovered only a few years ago by a historian um, that Cleveland Street Workhouse was literally around the corner uh, from where Dickens was living as a child and then again as a young adult in 1828 to 1831. And so the thinking goes, my gosh, this had to have some influence on Oliver Twist. Um, it becomes a hospital later. Um, when this photograph was taken, it was actually a hospital, but it, that's the original building that was a workhouse. Um, Dickens' ideas in politics, he's not a radical. Um, he's a member of the middle class and he distinguishes between the deserving and the undeserving paupers. He's sympathetic to the working poor, uh, but not to the uh, unemployed. And a prime concern for him and for all middle class is the linkage of poverty and crime. And a quote of his at the bottom, there's nothing on which it is so hard as poverty and there's nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. And that kind of encapsulates his ideas. Uh, I, I can't talk about this now, <laughs> but I wanted you to know one thing. There's a figure at the bottom center left and that's gonna be Mr. Bumble. 
but he wasn't Mr. Bumble yet. But absolutely, the, the illustrator for Oliver Twist saw this. And um, as you can see from the caricatures in the uh, actual novel of Twist, um, very similar. So uh, to wrap things up, he's a hard worker. Here's the month of March in 1837. He's produced a play that he's written. Then he's gonna perform in that play on March 13th as a benefit. He's the editor of Bentley's Miscellany, which is a monthly uh, magazine. He's completing 13th installment of Pickwick Papers. He's completing the third installment of Oliver Twist. And because he's the editor of Bentley's and they're short on articles, he has to write another article for Bentley's plus edit all the pieces that are coming in uh, for that month alone. And, and, and I left out things. He's also negotiating for publication of his sketches by Boz and doing other things. Plus he's a father. Um, he's a hard worker and he wants to make a lot of money. Um, and one of the things that he helps to revolutionize, and uh, maybe an overstatement, is the use of illustrations in his novels. Um, and time and time again, well, all of his novels will be illustrated, uh, even in his sketches by Boz when they're collected. And you can see over time different versions of, of illustrations didn't always stick to the originals. And I have to give you a warning. Uh, they have just identified Oliver Twist at the University of London um, as a piece that might be disturbing and upset students. Um, so when they teach Oliver Twist and, and a bunch of other novels, uh, students in the University of London, and this is happening elsewhere in, in England, uh, are now getting warning labels. And I follow this on Twitter, and it's interesting. There were about 12 professors who laid in, and they weren't happy, but they said, hey, essentially they said this, all, every one of them. Better that we warn people about reading Oliver Twist than banning books like the United States does. And with that, I turn things over to Doc. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually read the book, Oliver Twist, like this, you know, within the last few months. But what I want to tell you is don't watch Oliver <laughs> movie. Just don't do that. I mean, there are some moments that are, it, I, I directed the play and I, I used to laugh when I was directing the, oh my God, oh my God, this is not, not really as squeaky clean as, um, as the, uh, you know, the makers of the, of the movie and the play um, seem to want the audience to think. Um, I was informed, however, that there's a pretty good mini series that was created in 2007. Um, and I've actually viewed it and it's not bad. I mean, there's some inaccuracies, but, um, you know, if you find yourself totally um, behind in the reading, then, you know, you can catch up that way. But the most important thing is to read the book. All right. So uh, Oliver Twist was one of the first novels really about childhood. It's not that childhood wasn't an important issue in some earlier novels. In fact, I remember back in, back in the days um, in Henry Prickett's course in the 18th century novel at Middlebury, um, we read a book called Tristram Shandy, which is not a book for everyone, believe me. Um, it's an experimental novel, plays around with narration. Um, a lot of my fellow students said it was one of the most boring things they've ever read. However, it's pretty interesting. And there's a child the young Tristram, 
who certainly has to be the youngest person or the youngest child who has ever existed in literature because he begins to narrate pre-utero. He, right before the moment of conception, his mother asked his father that whether or not he had wound the clock. This created, unfortunately, a moment of coitus interruptus. And the, uh, you know, the narrator says that this, this was certainly a very negative event in his life because he claims that the forceps that had to be used by the physician crushed his nose. But definitely, Oliver Twist is the first great narrative of childhood. Now, I want you folks to participate. I'm not going to be talking at you as much, you know, I mean, I can do that, but I don't want to. So participate. You know, no question is dumb. No response is dumb. Oh, most responses aren't done. So participate. So since Oliver Twist is about childhood, I'd like to begin with the chimney sweeper, which all of you should have. And it was published in 1789. So this predates Dickens by, by quite a lot. And William Blake wrote it as and uh, published it as one of his songs of innocence and experience an illuminated text and you I, I believe have the illumination in front of you for those of you who are old veterans of my classes i have sound and sense which i may well have taught you um and uh, the poem is right here now if I want you to, as you, as we read the poem, think about connections with Oliver Twist. Think about uh, the tone. Think about irony. Think about the speaker, um, and think about the the satire, the social criticism. Satire often includes humor, and that's certainly something that that, that Dickens includes, but it doesn't always, at least, you know, I mean, it's not worth it getting into a discussion, you know, life is short, um, but it, it often is pretty serious in its social criticism. So I'm gonna begin by asking if there is anyone who would like to read the poem, and if not, I will give my version. Just blurt out. If you want to. No one's blurting. Okay. Time's, time's passing, so I'll read it. Remember, look for keywords. Think about the speaker. Think about irony. Think about social criticism. When my mother died, I was very young, and my father sold me while yet my, nung, my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep, and in soot I sleep. There's little Tom Dacre who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, hush, Tom, never mind it, for when your head's bare, you know that the soot cannot spoil your right hair. And so he was quiet. And that very night, as Tom was asleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack, were all of them locked up in coffins of black. And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain leaping, laughing they run, and wash in a river, and shine in the sun. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, 
They rise upon clouds and sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. And so Tom awoke and we rose in the dark and got with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Okay, so who wants to begin to talk about, let's say, the speaker in the poem? What do you know about him? Why is it important? I would say that we know um, that he was sold by his father, similar to the way Oliver Twist was sold mm -hmm. almost to a chimney sweep himself. Um, and so he's telling, you know, what his life was like having been sold um, and how things were explained to him as he went along, um, as far as, you know, looking for the positive in everything, uh, you know, like, doesn't matter you're covered in soot, if you shave your head, that's less to worry about. And why was the, why was, was it really because of soot that they shaved his head? No. <laughs> what was it? Lice. Lice, sure. Yeah. Lice. Yeah, good. Keep going. Not you necessarily, Ginny, but uh, you I, know. I can keep going if other oh, people would. Well, then, then I, love the, I love the whole thing about the coffins in black and lining them up similar to Oliver Twist as well, being forced to walk where, yeah. work where all the coffins were and have them be surrounded by them. Um, and what are the coffins in black? black? The chimneys. The chimneys, sure. sure. Yeah, they're, they're trapped in there, just like they're in a coffin. Yeah. So uh, reminiscent pretty, a lot of this of Mary Poppins and all our chimney sweeps in that. That's right. Yeah, it's you know it's different. everything different, relates to a musical different movie. world. Yeah. But then they had that great bit where he was talking about, oh, you just light a good fire under him, but you don't want smoke because that'll kill him. Like the fire will get him out because otherwise yeah. he'll just hang out there and like not work anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect, perfect. What are some words uh, that you folks? underlined, circled, or whatever you do when you try to identify an important word. What about in the first four lines, first quatrain, the word weep? Why weep? Okay, I liked it because <laughs> I'm just going to talk ah. out. <laughs> I liked it because it was like not only crying, but also like the weep of sweeping, like the tide with the sweep. The weep. Absolutely. Weep. Excellent. So it was both tears, but the sweeping of the chimney. Excellent. Um, those are some of my students know that I used to do what is called a table slap when somebody says something really smart and I'm sort of moving things here on my table to give <laughs> Ginny Hoffman a, a table slap. Well Thank done. Thank well you, done. Don. All right. You're welcome. You're right, welcome. I'll shut up now, okay. Other ideas about the poem, its connections to the, the there's that innocence to me in the speaker obviously because if when you look at the last line lines or the last line itself if all do their duty they need not fear harm i was really struck because up until that end i expected it to end with them all being dead and it didn't and that really surprised me yeah but why would he do this why would uh, why would blake have the kids say this it's that innocence right he doesn't know it's totally ironic because in fact if all do they do do their duty they will be dead right okay so it's that you know it's it's using the speaker the speaker of innocence you know and from the innocence and experience poems right this this kid has no idea you know, I mean, the angel with a bright key. Whoa, how cool is that? 
opened the co coffins and set them all free. So, you know, things are going to be just fine, but you're going to have to die first. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's the bottom line, in, you know, in the poem. Any other, I mean, I, I don't like to rush through things, but I need to a little bit here. Um, any other comments on the chimney sweep? I think you see the, the connection be between the plight of this kid and, I, yes, who? I, I was gonna say, I wonder too, with the symbolism of light and dark, sort of white and black, and like they refer to the lamb and that he has white hair, almost like these are sacrificial lambs because the mortality rate for these kids was unbelievable. It's excellent, excellent point. Excellent, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 one of my favorite poems. Always was one of my favorite poems to teach. And if if anybody who was here had me in tenth grade, we we read it. Period. And I use this book. All right. Okay. So let's move on to Oliver. Actually, did Alec? Oh, did you have something? What's that? Can you hear me? Alec Dakin has something. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can. Oh, okay. I was just, it sounds like a Edmund Burke type message. I don't know. Accepting your lot in life almost. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with that, Mr. Matt. But, Definitely. Uh, um, and kind of the weeping is very, I mean, Oliver cries all the time in the, when he's a kid. Mm -hmm. So there's the, you know, uh, connecting it to the, the childish ish childishness of the of the sweepers and the, yeah i think you're dead on because the the idea is if oliver does his work he will as they tell him fear no harm right yeah well it just might you know you know at least he got out of the the chimney chimney sweep john you yeah. know but but there is that that whole um, you know being with Mr. Sowerberry and, and being the mute at the funerals probably wouldn't have hurt him the way um, chimney sweeping did. But he had a good reason to leave. You want to go on to the book? Yeah. All right. So. Where do you folks see the most um, say effective or poignant moments of satire in the first, you know, first hundred pages or so? You know, try to get your book out and give me a page. So I'd say right from the very beginning in chapter one. I loved how when he was describing his birth and everything was happening. And one of the things I highlighted, I love the now if during this brief period, well, Oliver okay, had been surrounded it. by careful grandmothers. I think it was like the second page. Okay. Anxious aunts and experienced nurses and doctors of profound wisdom. He would have most inevitably and indubitably been killed in no time. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, there is that. there is this guilty pleasure that we're <laughs> laughing at these know, horrible it, things. You know, I mean, like, but that's the effect of his his satire. Like, you know, yeah, this is. This is just awful, but God, it's funny. It right? is. I mean, his whole description in the beginning of his birth and the people attending to him and everything they did and how they were doing it was just amazing satire on, you know, what people thought was good for them. Look at the very beginning too, um, on page three. Among other public buildings in the town of Mudfog, another thing, I mean, the names he chooses are just, yeah so good you know they're just so good sour bread. i mean it boasts of one which is common to most towns great or small to wit a workhouse and in this workhouse there was born on a day and date which i need not trouble myself to repeat inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader in this stage of the business at all events the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter for a long time after he was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear a name at, at all. I mean, 
you know, I mean, th this is such a criticism of the society and it's funny. And it also brings in, they're really kind of two narrative voices here, right? You have Dickens, you know, authorially um, interceding whenever he damn well pleases. And then you have, well, let, we'll use terms here, right? So you have, you have the third person subjective narrator. That is a third person narrator who's telling you something, but it's through the eyes of a particular character. And that's where Oliver, we see Oliver, and that's where we understand his innocence, okay? So, you know, here you have Dickens saying, well, this is the, you know, this is the way it was. And, and, and so it's almost impossible to get through a page of this book without encountering some satire. So who's the object, or who are the objects of satire, do you think, most, most prominently? The church? Yeah, how so? Well, all the workhouse, Mr. Bumble, and um, all of those uh, those the institutions, the charitable institutions that were established at the time, they don't look so hot here. Oh, we get to the charity house later, but this is a parochial yes. institution, as they yes point out often. <laughs> Uh, it's definitely satirizing the people who made these laws, um, especially once we get to page 13, he kind of you know, has a long satirical tirade on how sage, philosophical, yeah, well, why kind you, and knowing yeah, men the, these all are. The first big, uh, big paragraph on 13, read the beginning of it. The members Sorry. of the yeah, the members of this board were very sage, deep philosophical men. And when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered. Ah. The poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classers, a tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea and supper all the year round, a brick and mortar Elysium where it was ah. all play and no work. Oh, ho, ho, said the board, looking very annoying. We are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time. So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house or by a quick one out of it. That's great. Great. Wonderful. Okay. The, um, so, you know, so we're looking at the, the objects of the, sat, you know, the satire here, you know, clearly those who were involved in the workhouse, those who created the poor laws. Dickens is absolutely after them. So oh, there are some other examples of satire that you think perhaps um, relate to other issues in the novel. Doc, I was just going to say, it's, I was like, the times are so bad, it's like a parody of itself. <laughs> the times are so bad, it's like a parody of itself, the whole novel. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost the only way that you can look at this is like, it just, it's, it's so bad, it's almost, it's funny. It's, it's, you wouldn't think it was real, in a sense. I think Dickens kind of foresaw that maybe that's how people would see the time. Um, is it so bad? It's it's almost funny, which I think well, is yeah. You're dead on. You're dead on. And and you know, think about it. You know, you're thinking that the magistrates and every you know and and that group of the learned um, board, um, you know, might have some human compassion, and they do. I mean, there, there's you know, Dickens is certainly ambivalent about a lot of his characters, but. I love it when all of a sudden you, you realize that what they were looking for on page 21 and 22, and this is of course with um, 
Mr. Gamfield, the, the chimney guy, uh, they want they they want him to take over for discount. That's this is you know so even even when you have a moment when somebody seems like oh compassionate this is really good there's still well yeah I mean well, you know we're not going to pay that much you know we want you know we want a discount this is you know after all okay um, other comments about about. The satire, it's all over the place. Hi, I, I would say that all the, nearly all of the characters are caricatures. There, there are very few characters that Dickens seems to respect. And mm -hmm. you can tell, I mean, he's the, I, I probably learned it from somebody on this call, the omniscient observer, the, the narrator. He has a, an agenda, Dickens. He's not telling you it in a in a very um sub in a in an objective way, or and, subtle. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. And the, the few the few that um that are not characters, Nancy the prostitute, right? Um, the Maylies, uh, and really people who help the people who help Oliver have more depth. The people who either don't care about Oliver or wish to harm Oliver are the caricatures in the story. That's really good. That's really good. So take a look, let's just take a look. You mentioned you know, the caricatures. Let's take a look at what Fagin is on page um, 64, where there's the opening um, description of him. Okay. So I don't have the same version book that you have, but um, I was reading those pages and um, Fagin is, is first described as the Jew, he's then mentioned as Fagin, and then is continued to be called the Jew for as much as I read. Um, and if you're talking about caricatures, I just thought that, so when uh, Oliver is met by um, Jack Dawkins, mm -hmm. who, then know as the Arful Dodger. Yeah. Um, it's almost a scene of what I think today we would call child trafficking or human trafficking. Oh and, yeah, you know, that's saying, good point. You know, do you are you going to London? Uh, uh, got any lodging? Got any money? Hey, I've got you know, come with me. And then he buys him a meal, and it's uh, it's pretty astonishing. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, but then the way that Dickens is so brutal in his assessment, his um, uh, the visuals. I mean, he says that the that, uh, the Arful Dodger is um, the queerest looking boy. Yeah. Um, he he has a snub nose, flat brow. I mean, he he's just brutal in his assessment. But Peter, I have to say that um, I as a child, the nineteen sixty some version of the the musical Oliver. Yeah. I saw it again and again, and I think it was it it ran every year on TV for quite some time. Oh, yeah. I don't know when it stopped, but we had the the Broadway album, and my sister uh -huh. and I would listen to that again and again and again. So it's I haven't just seen it; I have I have it memorized. But um, well, well, then you can join us, and you know the final session when we're going to be singing songs from okay. the musical. And right. I just the last point. Um, not that it, this has to do with the characters, but that 1837 was a banner year and that Victoria does come to reign mm -hmm. and the first Oliver Twist, uh, what, what did you call it? Uh, not segment, but- Installment. I, I thought it was the entire Serial book. Serial installment, yeah. But anyway, um, and that I guess Victoria can't be blamed for at least what happened up to 1837. <laughs> That's all. Very good. So on 64, let's just take a look. Because I asked you to be thinking about how he creates characters. And we've looked at some already how he creates them through dialogue. Um, we've seen how they, he creates them through action. This is just strict description. Um, a very old, middle of the page, very old shriveled Jew whose villainous looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. 
He was dressed in a greasy flannel gown with his throat bare and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying pan and a clothes horse over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging. Just those, you know, those details, the greasy, greasiness, the, and yet, and yet, and this is where, you know, he's over, he's, he's over the frying pan. He's making a meal for his kids. You know, there's, there's that weirdness about Fagin. You know, he's evil and, and certainly Fagin has elicited, I was, I was, I was, I, you know, I, I was sort of with, with Kendall like into the book banning um, uh, zone and I, I checked to see when Oliver Twist, other than now in, in Britain, was controversial. And the last time it really was, was in the 1950s and the reason why it was banned from some libraries was because of the treatment of, of Fagan, the Jew, the stereotypes of, of the Jew. Um, I know that Kendall is raising his hand, which means I'm supposed to shut up. Sorry, Doc. I, 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 one thing, since if you're on page 64 yeah. and, and you have the same version we do, to the right, of course, is the illustration all yes. introduced to the respectable old gentleman. And there's all kinds, we're, we're gonna talk about illustrations later, but there are, are, is all kinds of writing by the experts that says that Crookshank picture of Fagan presents him as the devil because he's holding a fork like a pitchfork and with the face the way it is mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Fagin is the devil in this novel. Um, I, I apologize to Doc for taking some of his time to begin with. Normally we'll have time to answer questions. Um, and I promise you we will next time. No if you problem, have questions, if you have questions, feel free to um, email us. You have our emails uh, or ask them next time and I'll make sure that we do have time. Um, this is the most history I was going to cover was this time. So we want to thank Can you I very much. Can I of say course. That? Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> uh, each week I'll give you some study questions. It's not like we're going to talk about all these study questions. I mean, we're really, you know, when you think about it, we're trying to do a lot and we all are trying to do a lot in a little time. But the whole thing is with the study questions, you know, there are things to think about and Thinking is never a bad thing. Thank you, Doc. Um, thank you one and all for signing in and uh, joining us. I hope you uh, will join us again next week and we didn't scare you off. Uh, hopefully maybe next time there'll be a few more participants. Um, there's a couple students, former students who are awful quiet uh, and they were forewarned that they might They've be called. They've been noted. Yes, been noted. so um, we may get to them yet. Anyway, so thank you for uh, tuning in, and I uh, hope this fulfilled your expectations. And um, Heather, do you have any closing comment or anything? So, um, it, if if not, Heather, have a good night. Thanks. Thank See you, you next week. Next thank week. Thank you. Take, Take care. care.